very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, see if I can get this thing working over here. Not me. It looks not too good. Okay, uh, this is a historical perspective uh, in the first part of this on that. Uh, historical perspective on the turbo compound system. Uh, turbo compound engines were developed for aircraft back in the uh, early 40s through the 50s. And uh, they were made obsolete by the turbojet or aircraft use because people wanted to fly higher, faster. Uh, this is uh, very similar to our very first chart we had on here today, and that's the energy and the fuel. And uh, we're going to get into this in a little more detail. Uh, this is the, the total energy, and then uh, what they call sensible energy in this particular uh, chart, and uh, also um, thermal losses from the cylinder and the super supercharger, um, and then the net out, out, output out of the engine is only 1,600 horsepower with 5,410 horsepower input in terms of fuel energy.
BFFC range, which is uh, roughly what a, a diesel engine is. And of course, uh, again, this is technology that's 60 years old. Certain advances can be made uh, in uh, modern materials and the turbine and so forth, insulating the exhaust pipe and so forth and so on. Um, here you can see uh, this engine started life in 1943 as a normally aspirated engine. 
uh, well, I'm sorry, supercharged, but not turbo compounded. And then the turbo compound feature was added about 1947 or so. And uh, as the years progressed, uh, the takeoff power increased and the specific fuel consumption, uh, I'm sorry, specific weight pounds per horsepower uh, continually decreased. And in fact, this number right now, 0.9, is exceptional even for uh, most things to say maybe Formula Out now racing and it's Formula One in particular probably an exception to that rule. And this is the uh, development in terms of experimental test hours. Um, as you see, the line is still going straight up up here uh, in 1954 or 53. And they continue the development to 1955 or 60, and so the, the horsepower finally achieved was 3,850 horsepower. Um, and they, they, these are the early engines, the non-turbo compound, uh, with maximum 2,800 horsepower. So uh, they're well on the way to getting at least 150 uh, percent more power of the same engine using turbo compound. And of course, the BSFC was also decreasing. This R3350 uh, was actually, this engine was built in the thousands. There's no new technology here. This is uh, old technology, easily implemented today at low cost relative to some other approaches taken to this thing. Uh, this airliner here was capable of flying from uh, San Francisco to London nonstop, 24 hours, about 20 years ahead of the 747, capable of the same range. So it was an extremely efficient engine, and uh, it did have a lot of problems with it. Uh, it's, got, it's got the nickname of the best uh, tri-motor airliner in the world because uh, at least one of the exhaust valves would go out and take out the turbine, and so the pilot had to shut down that engine. They got the one that they had to change out the engine. That, that problem could be solved. So uh, I did a few 3Ds on this. Uh, this is uh, a V8 engine, a uh, typical V8 engine, maybe you find a Formula One car with a transmission, with the turbine mounted out uh, behind the gearbox. Now, there are some issues there about the crash, overall length of the car, the crash structure in the back, so forth and so on, but uh, I think the 20% uh, decrease in fuel consumption can more than make up for that. We be very careful about it. The engine looks a little disproportionate here because I, I drew this up in just a few hours and uh, my board spacing is a little too close and my seats on my crankshaft are a little too big. Here's a back view. Uh, you notice the turbine is right out in the atmosphere and uh, they discovered in World War II that this was a good way to cool the turbine. Uh, P-38 had this feature and also a P-17. Putting the turbine out in the atmosphere like this and uh, just letting uh, the air ball over to help keep the turbine cool. And the turbine blades are hollow, so it, it pumps cooling air through the blade automatically. You don't you really don't have to do very much in terms of cooling the blade. Of course, again we have better materials nowadays. Here's a close up view. I'm probably going really fast here. We we'll probably have a long question and answer period if you wish. Uh, and then the final view. Uh, this is another close up view. You can see the blades are hollow, and they'll pump air automatically into uh, the critical force. And here's the bottom view. And you can see there's really uh, a V8 inside that block. Uh, and I just knocked that out pretty quickly, so I, I really got the force base. So uh, that's it, uh, almost. Uh, this is some of the problems that you'll run into. <coughs> Uh, the tuning of the pipe between the cylinder and the, the turbine has an effect on the, on the pressure fall and the pressure of uh, uh, crank angle and so forth. So that's one of the areas of uh, future development. Um, I, I, sh uh, I uh, in my 3Ds, I showed a typical uh, collector system for V8, so um, I'm sure you can do a little bit further. Uh, development on that. Uh, now, these turbines are available off the shelf, so you know, you're not going to spend a lot of money building one of these. 
Wright refers to that as a slowdown curve. In other words, it doesn't work off pressure, back pressure on the exhaust, it works off the kinetic energy in the exhaust. And then the, the other type of turbine is the reaction turbine, which works off of uh, uh, pressure. The third type is the radial inflow turbine, which you find in turbochargers. So in theory here, in a, in a passenger car, you could actually use a turbocharger, basically, uh, connect the shaft to the, the turbocharger shaft, steer it down, and feed it back into the crankshaft. And that would make a very compact thing. Uh, currently, for um, uh, the, rate, the ordinary turbine in a turbocharger is way over horsepower compared to what it needed for steady state uh, uh, compressing the air. So that the reason it's over horsepower, it needs to accelerate really rapidly. So for a continuous horsepower engine, you could al almost take an automotive turbocharger, connect up a shaft, and steer it into the crankshaft and get a significant reduction in, in fuel consumption. Uh, and this is another interesting thing about this, uh, this was done a study by uh, NACA back in those days, and it turns out that at high speed, just squirting the exhaust out the back of the car will improve the BSFC. Basically, you're using the exhaust as a, a jet engine, and uh, the P51 and the, the, the Merlin uh, Bitfire, they both use this feature, and supposedly, uh, to some account, that was worth 400 horsepower in a P51 at 400 miles an hour. In this case, they have, uh, see if I can show you, the middle curve is 200 miles an hour, and the uh, lower curve is 350 miles an hour. So this is jet propulsion, and it dropped the BFFC about uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. That's a really interesting little feature about it. So uh, this is back to the beginning. Okay. Um, Any questions?
for cruising down the autostrada or whatever, uh, then uh, you're getting up in the more favorable range for turbo compound. The uh, curves and, uh, and uh, other types of uh, hybrid vehicles um, uh, do wonders for you in a Formula One environment where you're accelerating, you're standing on the brakes, you're accelerating, you're standing on the brake. Uh, in Formula One, uh, 17,000 to 19,000, 17,000 you ship, 19,000 you ship. So it's a very narrow range. So uh, turbo compound is ideal for Formula One situation, as is curves and hybrid systems. But when you get out in the real world where people are on the autostrada and they're doing a steady 80 miles an hour or something, then you have to uh, tune the system so it's giving you <coughs> maximum benefit under those circumstances. I hope you, I answered that thoroughly. Okay. I'm just going to make the comment on the last question, but That's correct, yes. The, the gentleman has mentioned that, uh, got to say that, but Detroit Diesel is now built at, incidentally, they're, they're partnered with Dammler, so in Europe it's called a Dammler engine. It's a turbo compound diesel, and diesels have way less uh, kinetic energy in the exhaust than uh, than a uh, gasoline piston engine. So um, if they can get, uh, I think, a 5% reduction in BFFC with a diesel, and uh, in, the, in the case of the 50 horsepower additional and a 5% reduction in the BFFC, and, and this engine is uh, in production. I don't know if they sold any yet, but uh, certainly no, they no, There's another manufacturer who had it in production on, on the road. Scania. Scania, that's Scania. Right. Volvo was experimenting with it. A couple of with years. It. Only in the Euro 3 version. The Euro 4 doesn't have the turbo compound. Pardon? Scania was only available in the turbo compound in Euro 3 uh, homologation. Oh, in Australia? Euro 3 homologation. I, 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 Emission I, regulation. Okay, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Um, the major breakthrough uh, as far as turbo compounded diesel engines in the Detroit diesel model was they paid a lot more attention to the aerodynamics and the heat loss between the turbocharger and the turbine. And that's very expensive. I mean, very important, rather. You, you want to minimize any heat loss through the system. So the ideal system would use the same turbine for the turbochargers that you're using for turbo compound because now you're minimizing your heat loss and uh, your kinetic energy loss. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm probably being a bit naive here, but um, uh, obviously you, you're taking all this energy out of the exhaust. Yes. Um, and you, you bring back into the engine. Why don't you see more engines putting it sort of mechanically back into the crankshaft rather than using it to compress? Uh, well, mechanically putting it back into the crankshaft is generally the most efficient way of doing it because gear trains are uh, up there at 98% efficient. Um, if you use a, a generator and then a motor, you're adding a lot of weight. You're also, let's say, <coughs> give it the benefit of the doubt that the generator is 90% efficient and the motor is 90%. That's 81%. Now you're throwing away 20% of your recovered energy right there. So um, I disagree with magnetic. magnetic. Mega people, they, they want to use, uh, also, uh, by the way, um, um, uh, some American companies were working on that, too. I think Caterpillar Tractor built some uh, electric turbo compound. They did a lot of development work on that, too. And, uh, I answered that question. Another one. How does the efficiency improvement look like over the low uh, zero to low? In the case of the Detroit Diesel, there was significant uh, recovery throughout the RPM range, the operating RPM in the range of the diesel, I think it was from 1,000 to 2,000 RPM. That's a, a 350 to 450 horsepower uh, diesel in, in uh, various configurations. So there was a benefit, and they had they did not use a variable exhaust nozzle. Uh, they just used a straight uh, a, a low down turbine that worked off the uh, kinetic energy and not the pressure energy. So you were know, referring to the RPM range. I was referring to the torque range. Oh, torque range. Uh, well, the torque over the range uh, had to increase because the horsepower over the range increased. So, you know, horsepower per transfer. Yeah. So you get more torque, too. So uh, any other questions? Oh, OK. I, uh, by the way, uh, I've been thinking about this for 30 years, and I've been proselytizing on this for 30 years. 
haven't made much headway yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.